our next speaker. Uh, we have the recorded video of Dr. Geoffrey Rose. Uh, sir was not able to join us today because of prior commitments. I would like uh, the team, AV team, to please share the recorded video of sir's lecture. Thank you very much for asking me to speak. And I would like to detail the giant fornix syndrome or how to spend 10 minutes learning about an important condition that may well save many an eye. So the giant fornix syndrome, how was it recognized? Well, in the 1990s, I saw a few very elderly patients who were referred with gross chronic conjunctivitis and lacrimal drainage obstruction, like this patient. Most had some degree of ptosis, often worse on the affected side. And here was a typical sort of patient. And when you looked, they had an absolutely filthy eye with a big mucus seal. And at that time, I thought it was the toxic debris causing this problem with the cornea vascularization. It was just toxicity of the surface debris. Well, these patients would undergo successful and uncomplicated external DCR and with complete elimination of the lacrimal sac mucus seals, so there was no more debris to come back into the eye. After improving for a few days to a few weeks, the condition would actually then return to what it was before. And so what was going on here? I really couldn't make this out. Looking at the patients after DCR one day, I noted that one of the patients had a huge protein coagulum like a fried egg lodged deeply in the upper fornix. And you can just see the tip of the coagulum there. Very hard to illustrate because it's a very long way up and lots and lots of pus and debris around. The protein coagulum, when you removed it, always cultures Staphylococcus aureus. And the presence of this coagulum leads to a very severe, quite often hemorrhagic conjunctival reaction. The bacteria and the toxins within the coagulum are pouring onto the ocular surface. So how does this condition occur? Well, I present a hypothetical mechanism based on the work that I have done. First of all, these patients probably start with a severe chronic conjunctivitis due to the bacteria and debris in the tear film. This causes ocular surface irritation and pseudomembrane formation due to the protein exudation into the tear lake. This then coagulates to form a bacterial laden protein coagulum, which lodges itself in a very large upper fornix. That coagulum then keeps persistently re-inoculating the ocular surface with low-grade bacteria. It forms a Petri dish, putting bacteria onto the front of the eye. And these bacteria in turn keep fueling the chronic conjunctivitis, so you get a positive feedback loop. A large lacrimal sac mucosal in these patients may well have been the initial early chronic infection in patients who are liable to form this positive feedback loop. The chronic inflammation and debris leads to an increase in conjunctival surface area due to papillary response and redundant conjunctival folds. And these in turn will give greater area for protein exudation and also more spaces in which you can develop a protein coagulum. As we get older, the upper fornix does get deeper with age due to disinsertion of the levator aponeurosis. So it, it's a, particularly a problem with elderly people who will get this huge upper fornix that can collect the coagulum. And the chronic severe ocular surface inflammation worsens the ptosis in these patients. And that in turn also deepens the upper fornix. So what are the characteristics of the giant fornix syndrome, which I described back about 20 years ago now? Well, 
had 12 patients, of whom 10 were female. They're aged 77 to 93, so they're all in their ninth and 10th decade. And these patients typically had lots of episodes of severe conjunctivitis over anything from one to four years. It often passed unrecognized for long periods, and indeed, I didn't recognize it in the early days. I thought it was all down to the lacrimal sac mucosal, um, and it was only when you had persistent problems after a successful DCR that I wondered what was going on. What is the importance of this condition? Well, it has major visual morbidity. Nine out of the 12 patients that were referred had severe corneal vascularization uh, due to the extreme toxicity and the cytokines and the vasoactive agents that were secreted in this toxic tear lake. And in eight of those patients, the acuity was counting fingers or less when they were finally referred to me. The second area of importance is that there is major ocular morbidity associated in that it is so toxic that you get corneal melting and five of the 12 patients had spontaneous corneal perforation or decimetacil as here you can see the decimetacil. So how do we treat the giant fornic syndrome? Well, in many patients in the UK, they can't treat themselves effectively at home. They're far too elderly. And so we may admit them for a day or two. We then treat them with hourly potent steroids to quieten the inflammatory response and two hourly anti-staphylococcal agent. We will also give them systemic ciprofloxacin for five days because these highly inflamed surfaces settle much faster with a bit of systemic antibiotic. And in some cases, if there's a lot of coagulum formation, you can sweep the upper fornix with a amethacane, tetracaine soaked cotton bud two or three times daily to remove the coagulum. You only need to do this for a day or two. Long term, these patients, you should tail down the topical treatment very, very slowly over weeks to months. They have had such severe inflammation that if you suddenly top, stop the topical treatment, you will get a recurrence of the disease. You may need to perform lacrimal drainage surgery if there is a mucosal. And it may be necessary to continue the once daily dosage for topical antibiotic steroid preparation, for example, at night, long term, because these patients with their large fornix are liable to relapse at some stage. The alternative is to use once daily polyvidone iodine 5% eye drops. Again, they're used at night, it's a good time to use them. And some patients who have an abnormally large fornix and really don't settle, one can consider resecting some of the upper fornix conjunctiva. So in summary, when you see this sort of patient with a filthy eye, ptosis, elderly patient, they've already got an aponeurosis disinsertion, but it's markedly increased on the side where it's mucky and huge ptosis and an ocular surface that is looking extremely filthy. Think giant fornic syndrome, think giant fornic syndrome, and you will save the patients ending up with visions down at count fingers and so on, and the severe complications like perforation. Thank you very much, everyone.